welcome after the break in the multi-purpose room in uh, Wrocław Convention Center. We are here for diversity for the conference and it's our fir third session, uh, second parallel session. At the same time, uh, the other session, session about housing started below us, in the room below us. Here we will talk about environment. Before that, I will remind you that the diversity for Polish-Norwegian cooperation in the field of creating modern development solution in cities benefits from 300,000 uh, euro grant from Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway through the EEA and Norway, gra Norway grants. The initiative aims to identify the most effective solutions and create a cooperation network as well as exchange ex experiences between Polish self-governments and the donor states with particular emphasis on the subject of social participation in urban renewal and improvement of the urban environment. I will remind you as well that uh, as we are uh, conducting this conference under pandemic, uh, we recommend for you to cover your mouth and noses uh, in the common areas of the conference uh, to keep your social distance, which is enabled here by the, by the chairs that are spread uh, throughout the rooms, and to disinfect your hands while uh, going into the conference rooms. Uh, as I mentioned before, now we will be talking about environment and we will hear the conclusions and recommendations from series of expert workshops. I will give the floor now to Marta Laska, PhD engineer, environment thematic leader, who is assistant professor at the Department of Air Conditioning, Heating, Gas and Air Protection at Wrocław University of Science and Technology. I will ask Marta now to present her team and present the results of expert workshops. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gents. My name is Marta Laska and I work at the Faculty of Environmental Engineering at the Wrocław University of Science and Technology. And I have a great pleasure to introduce our uh, today experts of the panel of the environment. Uh, we have with us, uh, we have uh, experts from Iceland, from Norway, and two experts from Poland. I would like to welcome uh, Svava, Ms. Svava Steinersdochter uh, from uh, Iceland. I would like to introduce Dr. Brit Hoiskar from uh, Norway, and also two Polish experts, uh, Dr. Uh, Magdalena Baborska Narożny uh, from the Faculty of the Architecture and uh, also Dr. Natalia Fidorów Kaprawy uh, from the Faculty of Environmental Engineering. First of all, I would like to uh, say a few words uh, about uh, the plan of our presentation. Um, uh, basically, first part, uh, this will be a uh, part with speeches of our experts, and the second part will be uh, the part uh, for the discussion, hopefully a fruitful discussion with you as an audience. Uh, our panel um, uh, summarizes our work that we did for the last few months, and at this point, I really would like to thank the professor uh, who gave the keynote speech uh, today uh, and who stressed that environment is an extremely important um, aspect of today's life and really, re we really have to uh, look into it closer. And during our uh, workshops, we identified that uh, in modern cities, the, the most important problem at the moment is the air quality. Uh, it really um, influences our life. This is why we have to um, know how to identify the sources of the pollution in the cities. And also, we have to know how to uh, prevent this. Um, this is why now I would like to... Uh, um, invite Dr. Natalia Fidorov Kaprave to introduce us into the context. Uh, thank you, Marta. Uh, as Dr. Laska said, um, the, uh, we focused on air quality as uh, this is very important. And um, main sources of uh, pollution in cities 
uh, are road transport and households. Uh, and the most, the main pollutants are uh, dust and NO2. Uh, but the uh, air quality is not only an environmental problem. Uh, we uh, have to face some um, uh, severe problems with health uh, and bad air quality causes also costs and by costs I mean uh, money. Uh, money spent for healing people, money spent uh, for workers' replace replacement. Uh, the care for air quality uh, it's included in legal framework, so it's our obligation, but each and every citizen um, may also contribute uh, to the better air quality in the cities. Uh, according to the uh, European law, cities are uh, responsible for the uh, for improving air quality. They have to control the pollution levels. Uh, they have to identify and implement uh, control measures, uh, but it's also important for them to inform the public, and it's, it is also the legal obligation, but not only. Uh, but the most important thing uh, is that the cities have to develop action plans uh, which have to have clear responsibilities and uh, timeframes. As I already mentioned, um, the emissions come from households and uh, air quality uh, influence our health, uh, so it overlaps uh, with other areas uh, that are talked about uh, on this conference. Um, during the workshops, uh, we agreed that uh, uh, Achieving good air quality is a process, sometimes a long one, but uh, and each country and each city uh, has uh, its own um, experiences, but, this, but we can learn from each other and we have to learn from each other. Uh, so during uh, the workshops, we thought that three things are most important. Uh, city have to have an action plan as a workable response to a clear challenge. Uh, and I will explain more about uh, the action uh, plan later. Uh, second, most important things, uh, for most important things, is to get funds, because without funds, uh, this action plan will remain on the paper. So without money, we, don't, uh, we can't make any actions. And the third important thing is to give the clear message to the public. Because uh, raising uh, social awareness uh, will in time help us uh, to bring up unpopular decisions which have to be made, uh, sometimes uh, in case of uh, air protection or environment protection. Um, and people might don't like those uh, decisions, but they will know uh, why they had to be made. Thank you, Natalia. Now I would like to introduce also all the um, experts from our panel to share their experience and to present the problems their countries are struggling with. Svava, you are the first. Thank you. Uh, greetings from Iceland and a uh, good day to you all. Uh, I will be talking uh, about how we tackle air quality problems in the city of Reykjavik, Iceland. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, the main source for air pollution in the city of Reykjavik is tra traffic, fireworks, and uh, geothermal power stations. We're lucky enough not to have any heavy industry within the city limits. And uh, the house heating in uh, Iceland is done by uh, geothermal water. So uh, 
housing uh, uh, problems from uh, wood burning or coals is not existent since the middle of the last century. Uh, the long-term policy on air quality in the city of Reykjavik is embedded in various different policies and agendas. And uh, what we are mainly doing is to increase urban density to uh, lessen the travel distances, improve the public uh, transport system, and we have very ambitious plans for new and environmental friendly buses or uh, small trains. Uh, more paid parking areas, uh, especially downtown, and better infrastructure for electric cars, bikes, and walkers. And we're uh, putting special emphasis on the electric cars at the moment and giving out grants for loading stations at uh, residential houses and companies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to show you an example of a winter's day in uh, Reykjavik when there's high particulate matter pollution. You can see that on the picture uh, to the left. And then on the picture to the right, you can see uh, the firework madness on New Year's Eve in Reykjavik, with, which results in very high uh, pollution limits and uh, it's uh, uh, something we're trying to uh, uh, lower because we have actually set a world record in particulate matter on that one day a year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but uh, the city of Reykjavik has an uh, air quality action plan and we uh, put our first action plan in motion in the year 2009 and we regularly revise it, and the latest version was made now in 2020. And this action plan defines the local air pollutants, the sources of those pollutants, and lists all the relevant regulations and health limits for each uh, uh, pollutant. And this action plan takes two short-term measures to implement when the air quality passes the legal health limit. And the most common actions that we use are public warnings, where uh, the public is warned via radio uh, announcements, press releases, and releases on uh, the city website and Facebook pages. Then there is dust biting, where we spray magnesium chloride uh, solutions on the streets to prevent particulate matter from being uh, suspended in the air. Street cleaning, and uh, the temporarily lowering uh, the speed limit uh, in the most affected areas. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the action plan stipulates that uh, there has to be an action team uh, that uh, takes care of uh, all the actions in the plan. And this action team uh, monitors the air quality and determines when it's appropriate to use the short-term measures. And uh, the team is responsible for issuing the public warnings and the press releases. But uh, it is very important if you have an action team that the members of this team, they have to have the authority to request and use the short-term measures without having to uh, consult with their superiors, or going through some red tape, they must be able to directly instruct the relevant uh, uh, members uh, uh, of the various offices what to do without hesitation. And uh, a member of an action team should be a representative of all the uh, uh, main offices concerned. Here in Reykjavik, we uh, also have uh, uh, a member from the road and coastal administration that takes care of all the highways in the countries. And uh, there are some roads, uh, heavily trafficated roads in the city that are defined as uh, national highways. And then all the uh, uh, city offices that have, have responsibility for cleaning and public health, etc. And the action team makes the implementation of an action plan much easier because you've cut through all the pathways that uh, can, you know, uh, uh, make things take a longer time. 
it makes uh, uh, all action more direct and efficient. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we've also uh, uh, taken part in uh, several ad campaigns to raise awareness of uh, uh, things that uh, it will increase the pollution in the city area. And uh, last year we uh, launched an uh, ad campaign with a public transport company, and uh, it's called Grey Days, where it promotes the use of public transport on days where air quality is bad. And the great day refers to the uh, pollution haze that lies over the city during the worst days. And that slogan has really caught on. People are talking about great days now if there is air pollution. And then every year there is an ad campaign in both autumn and spring to discourage the use of studded tires within the city because they create particulate matter. And then there is an ad campaign against uh, idle engines, and uh, it's in the form of sign and information campaign, uh, especially to discourage the idle engines outside of schools and kindergartens where people are dropping off their kids or picking them up. Um, next slide, please. Here you can see uh, examples of the posters for the ad campaigns. The first one, it says, rest the car on gray days. And uh, the next one is for the studded tires. It says studded tires are unnecessary in the city of Reykjavik. And the last is for the idle engines. And it says breathe easier, turn off the car. Um, and the next slide, please. Uh, and the Environment Agency of Iceland has an air quality information website where all the communities around the country uh, uh, are connected with their air monitoring station. So there you can see the uh, hourly uh, values of all the pollutants that are being measured in Iceland. And this is readily available to the public so they can uh, check the air quality in their area. And uh, at the end of the year, we will also have a, a pollution forecast in this system. But um, that was all I wanted to tell you about the city of Reykjavik, and I will give the floor now to uh, Britt in Norway. Thank you. Thank you. Britt, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marta. Um, so also great, uh, greetings from, from Oslo um, and Norway. And we're very happy to uh, have been invited to participate in the diversity team. Um, I will give a brief, uh, a very brief overview of how we work with air quality issues in Norway and share some of the experiences we've had, we have gained the last 10 to 15 years. Um, I will mainly focus on Oslo since this is the largest city in Oslo, in, in Norway, and uh, also the city that has had the greatest uh, challenges with air pollution. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, I try. <laughs> oh, you try. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay, the main challenges in Oslo is related to NO2, uh, nitrogen dioxide and uh, particular matter. And the main source for NO2 is um, exhaust from uh, the traffic and then mainly from diesel vehicles. Um, for PM10, road dust from traffic is the main source. Um, in Norway, uh, just like in Iceland and all the Nordic countries, the use of studded tires during the winter season leads to significant pavement wear and generation of road dust, which then is the most uh, important source uh, in, uh, in Norway and Oslo. Uh, and then in addition, wood burning is also an uh, important source still and contributes both to PM10 and PM2.5 levels. Next, please. I try and try. Okay, <laughs> sorry. About there it this. is. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one back. Is it too far? Oh yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the municipality of Oslo has been working systematically for many years in order to reduce air pollution and has developed a series of action plans throughout the years, which has been updated and adjusted several times. 
Um, so this is a process that has gone over many years and Oslo has introduced new measures step by step. And the process typically start with an air quality assessment where measurements and air quality models are used to get a very good understanding of the status today and the main sources of air pollution. Uh, and the next step is to identify uh, relevant abatement measures and estimate the effect of different measures. Um, and based on these um, air quality assessment, uh, an action plan is defined uh, with a set of effective measures and with a time frame or deadline for the implementation of each measure. And the last one is really important in order for uh, to ensure that action is actually or the measure is the measures is uh, actually um, implemented. Also, um, in order for the air quality assessments to be approved by the um, national authority, the Norwegian Environment Agency, the action plan has to be approved by the city council, which also means that they have that they are obliged to implement the measures within the set time frame, and they are also obliged to al allocate the necessary funds to do so. In addition, the measures included in the action plan must be sufficient for the city to comply with air quality limits within a few years or a, a certain time um, set in the, the, the directives. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so Oslo has now a package after many years with the increasingly um, more and more uh, measures being uh, implemented. We now have a, a, a quite a large package of measures to target um, air pollution. Um, I cannot present all of them, but I will highlight some of them. Many of the long-term measures implemented in Oslo are based on the polluter pays principle. Um, for example, one of the most successful measures to reduce road dust has been taxes for vehicles that use studded winter tires. That's a measure that has been implemented for many years and means that if you choose to drive with studded winter tires, you have to pay a fee to drive into the municipality of Oslo. And this has proven to be very effective to be a very effective measure to reduce the number of cars with studded tires. And today, um, approximately 90% of the cars in Oslo use um, non-studded winter tires. Um, you also have to pay a fee to drive into the municipality of Oslo. Uh, there are several toll rings uh, to drive into the center. Uh, and the size of the fees depends on the type of car you drive. For example, if you drive a diesel car, you have to pay five times more than if you drive an electric car. The principle again is that polluter pays, but it is also an incentive to speed up the introduction of zero emission vehicles. In addition, you have to pay extra um, if uh, during the rush hours, and this encouraged people to choose public transport when they commute to work uh, and reduces the traffic in the city. Uh, and this is also important because even if everybody started to drive electrical vehicles, we would still have a problem with um, road dust. So it's important in any case to make sure that the traffic does not increase. Um, so in parallel with these uh, measures, Oslo has also over many years improved public transport. So now in spite of population growth in and around Oslo, the traffic has not increased the last, uh, last years. Um, these taxes give the municipality an income that the city then can use to fund the cost of other measures to reduce air, uh, air pollution, like uh, cleaning the roads more often, uh, building new cycle lanes or improve further public transport. It is also important that the uh, policy at the national level, as well as the laws and regulations, um, supports the city's policy to reduce air pollution. In Norway, for example, uh, the electric vehicles have been exempt from uh, VAT since 2001, and you do not pay any annual road tax if you drive an electric car. This means that it is much cheaper both to buy and to drive 
uh, an electric car compared to a diesel or petrol car. Uh, so in this way, the Norwegian car tax system uh, set by the national government supports uh, the cities in uh, their work, work to reduce their pollution from cars. Uh, also, I'd like to mention that the national authorities in Norway, um, uh, the Norwegian Environment Agency, the National Road Authorities and the Norwegian Directorate of Health, have together developed tools that support the municipalities in their work uh, with air quality. Uh, next. Last year, they launched a new forecasting system that provides air quality forecast for the coming three days um, for all the large cities. And in fact, uh, next please. <laughs> uh, the forecast covers all of Norway. Uh, so these forecasts are, are available then for the municipalities and helpful tool for them to know um, uh, how the situation will be a few days ahead and in case they have to um, Im uh, implement uh, short term measures uh, on days with very high air pollution uh, and these forecasts are also um, uh, visible to um, the public. In addition, they have also, like the slide we see now, they have also developed an air quality planning tool for the municipality to support their work with air quality. I think this is, I don't know of any other such solutions actually in any other countries, but with this tool, um, uh, this tool provide the municipality with information that are very relevant for doing air quality assessments and develop air quality plans. For example, the tool provide annual air quality status map that shows the geographical extent of air pollution in, in the cities. Um, and here you can see an example of um, uh, annual mean levels for PM10 in Oslo. Uh, and the, these kind of map give a good indication of the levels of the pollutant and where in the city you find the highest values. Uh, and it can also indicate if it also indicates if the levels are above the limit value set by the directives. So these are model valued, not measured valued, but it's really a good in, a help and uh, in, uh, tool for the municipality. Next. The tool also provide information on the sources and how uh, much the different sources are contributing to the concentrations of the different compounds. And this is really important information for the municipalities in order to identify effective uh, abatement measures. Uh, so it's important to know whether it's um, emissions from uh, traffic or from wood burning or from shipping or industry that is the most important so that you target um, and you implement the, the, the correct abatement measures. Next. They also provide what we call air quality zone maps for city planners. Um, these maps shows areas in the cities where air pollution may be a challenge and where there may be restrictions concerning the type of buildings uh, or activities that you are allowed to, to set up. Uh, this is also um, uh, not something I've seen uh, uh, in any other city, uh, country. Um, just to, to uh, sum up, I mean, the close collaboration between the national and local authorities uh, we now have in Norway um, has given results. And I believe this is kind of collaboration is very important to achieve the goal of reducing air pollution and provide good air quality for all citizens, because you need actions both on local and national level to succeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Britt. It was very interesting. And now, could you please, Magdalena and Natalia, introduce how it looks like in Poland? Uh, we will focus on the next next slide, please. Uh, on Wrocław. Um, Wrocław, uh, as all uh, cities uh, of more than 100,000 inhabitants in Poland, have the obligation to monitor air quality. And it does so. It does so in accordance with the air quality directive. It is very important to stress that the directive is from 2008. So we're 12 years into its um, 
life. And uh, Wrocław has indeed taken a lot of measures to improve air quality since 2008, but we are still um, dreaming of such green maps as Brit has shown us from Oslo and uh, from Reykjavik, uh, Sława. Uh, so Wrocław uh, also has, uh, as I said, um, air quality monitoring. Uh, it has uh, some forecasting of air pollution. It is all available to the public on um, open websites. Uh, it has, um, as all other regions in Poland, uh, air quality reports based on the monitoring data. Next slide. Uh, from these reports, uh, you can easily count that um, the main source of emissions of air pollution in Poland, in Polish cities. This is for Wrocław, but it applies to most regions other than seaside regions, where um, we had the keynote speaker from Gdańsk. Uh, for Wrocław, uh, domestic solid fuel combustion is responsible for um, 94, this is data for 2018, for 94% of benzoapyrene emissions. And transport is 14 or 11 for particulate matters. This is um, very different in comparison with Reykjavik and Oslo, but the process that you have um, shown us is applicable also to um, to fighting the domestic solid fuel combustion. Next slide. So Wrocław has implemented for quite a few years now a few policies targeting specifically solid fuel combustion. Uh, we are now in a situation where 2024 is the deadline uh, for a ban on most domestic solid fuel combustion within the city boundaries. This is extremely challenging. This is more than challenging. Um, we will talk more about it uh, in our um, research component presentation. But the big thing is to understand that Wrocław has come to the point where it has uh, defined its um, measure of success in, um, in uh, challenging so, uh, Air, air pollution. And this measure of success for Wrocław is eliminating almost 19,000 solid fuel, fuel stoves from households across the city. And in order to do that, the city um, has run several programs that support citizens in changing their solid fuel burning stoves. We will talk about it more uh, later. Next slide, please. What is important about the approach, specific approach that Wrocław has taken is that it has, it's now three years of um, constant collaboration with a, a team from Wrocław University of Science and Technology uh, in order to better understand the problem. Because without understanding the problem, it's impossible to define the success measures and it's impossible to implement policies that will be successful for years to come. So about these three projects, again, I will tell more in the research uh, component presentation. Um, as Magda said, uh, we don't have uh, big emissions from road transport, but Wrocław is uh, trying to uh, cut emissions from this transport. Uh, a city is uh, doing this by discouraging car use and um, encouraging using green transport uh, like city bikes or, uh, elect or uh, public uh, transport. Uh, and to do so, to encourage people to use those uh, kind of ecological transport, uh, city is uh, developing uh, those areas. Um, 
the measures of uh, success might be uh, multiplication of cycling path length um, and that we can uh, rent city bikes or electric cars. Uh, and also uh, that Wrocław was in uh, finals of uh, some prestige uh, cont uh, contests um, connected with uh, the transportation. Mm. And Wrocław is also aspiring to be the green uh, capital of uh, Europe. Uh, the city is uh, taking part in the contest uh, in which uh, cities uh, of our guests all, uh, already had, uh, already succeeded. Uh, it was mentioned many times before that it's uh, important to give the information to the public. So, uh, Wrocław has many channels for communication and the goal is to um, inform as many citizens as possible and give uh, the really clear uh, message to the people. Uh, what is important when uh, talking about the policy uh, is that the local and national law have to be co uh, coherent. And in Poland we can see that this uh, coherency is only uh, partial. Uh, uh, you can see on the map that only some voivodships uh, have uh, banned the old stoves and only some cities banned uh, uh, the solid fuels burning. Uh, we have the programs like uh, change the stove or clean air that are supporting uh, the clean air policy. Uh, but we also face the situations like uh, the one shown in the pictures uh, uh, in the bottom. Uh, and this is uh, the coal in national colors. So it's encouraging to use coal for your uh, uh, heating. And uh, now I would like to sum up uh, the, our work on, on the workshops and what, all what have been uh, told here today. Um, we worked on the solution and we uh, called it uh, Toolbox. Uh, the solution is presented on the slide. Uh, first of all, we have to define uh, the challenge, and it has all been talked about during the presentation. Uh, we need to uh, define uh, the goals, the deadlines, the success measures, and then we have to prepare the action plan, which uh, have to have long, medium, and short-term uh, measures. And we called it a toolbox because it should have tools um, to solve all kinds of problems uh, as well uh, long-term policies uh, as well as, uh, uh, for example, um, rapid pollution episodes. Okay, next one. Uh, we talked about the action plan uh, that each city should prepare. Uh, first of all, each city should uh, define their uh, sources of pollutants, uh, so the sources of a problem um, and the level of the problem, because uh, each city may face different uh, problems, different issues. Uh, it is really uh, important to uh, follow the rule that I'm responsible for my pollutions and their production level uh, because uh, it's obvious that I can't cut the pollutions from my neighbors so if I have to focus on my problems and if uh, each city focus on its own problems maybe uh, the overall situation will be uh, also uh, better uh, the action plan should have clear goals. For example, we have to write, I don't know, uh, we will rise the energy from renewables to 40%, not just we will rise the uh, 
energy from renewables, the share of energy from renewables. So it has to be, be really specific. Um, it has to describe how to evaluate the actions. So we also need the tools uh, to, um, to know how to uh, assess our actions. Um, and really, really important is that the action plan should have defined deadlines so we would know uh, when the deadline date comes, if we succeeded or not, uh, or if, we, uh, if it's the uh, milestone, milestone uh, we have to know uh, if we have to do more or if we have done enough. Um, and what's also important when uh, thinking about uh, action plans, when thinking about policies, uh, is to have a longer perspective. Uh, we have to think about uh, what's our goal in the future, uh, because if we make fast decisions now, uh, it can lead us to uh, undo some things in the future. Uh, for example, if we only get rid of stoves and we don't uh, thermomodernize the buildings, we can uh, face the situation the, um, where after the thermomodernization, uh, we have to replace the uh, heating source again. Uh, or, for example, if we don't um, evaluate the citizens' income and we don't... Uh, take it into consideration, we can face the fact uh, of the fuel poverty, uh, which will cause uh, more uh, problems and more costs uh, in the future. Thank you very much. As you could see, it was uh, very difficult to find one golden solution for all the problems for all the cities in terms of quality, especially that we come from different backgrounds and we have different experiences and also we face different problems. However, we, this, is, this is what we worked out uh, during the last few months, that every city has to have this action plan that is reliable and where the deadlines are achievable, so defined and achievable deadlines. The second very important thing is to get funds to implement this action plan, so we have to think about this as well. And the third extremely important uh, point is that we have to get this message to the public. People, citizens and all interested groups, they have to be informed. Uh, I know that uh, we come with different problems, so I really welcome you to the discussion. Maybe you already have some questions like, is the pollution a big challenge in your city? Or maybe you have some larger uh, obstacles in terms of improving air quality, or maybe you already have something like an action plan. So thank you very much for this um, uh, for um, hearing us, and please, you're welcome to ask the questions. If not from audience, maybe from the chat. Yes, please. Hello, my name is Eliza Bujalska. I'm a deputy mayor from Minsk Mazowiecki, a smaller city next to Warsaw. Thank you very much for this actually very uh, rich and, and informative um, prelection. I'm actually not proud to say that our small city is one of the top in terms of the most polluted city as for the air. So our air, qual air quality problem is really, really huge and we are analyzing how we could possibly reach this. And there are so many lovely solutions, but I don't think we can just start with the infrastructure for the electric cars at the moment, um, or ban the city from, uh, from the cars in the center, because we definitely would hit a huge protest from our citizens. So I see that first we need to start with um, reaching the citizens and getting the message to them. But my question is, 
what would be, I, I know that there should be two lines of getting the message first. The message is the content, the merit, like we're doing this and this because of that and that. But the second aspect is how to actually get the citizens on our side so that they understand the meaning, the reason, the need for working, collaborating all together to actually reach a better quality of air. Um, are there any uh, good practices, ideas, suggestions, something that worked, other things that did not work out? We are actually trying some little um, ideas. For example, we have, um, um, I would say, air sensors in one of the schools, and then we have students who are actually analyzing the levels, and they're playing with this, like, oh, so the level is like that, oh, not so good. Uh, so we're trying to, to maybe reach it through students. Um, but if there's any, any good uh, practices that we could um, follow on, that we would be very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think this question is actually to Svava. <laughs> Could you answer, please? Well, uh, we uh, have used many ways to get the message across to our citizens. And uh, the, the main thing for the public health authority where I work is that we have both been in collaboration with the university and supported their research programs. And uh, then we've uh, taken part in uh, the uh, introductions of the results of those research programs. We've also gone into uh, schools and uh, both uh, high schools and uh, elementary schools and given lectures on uh, air quality because we believe that uh, starting early, you, you get the thought across to uh, the next generation. And uh, by uh, giving these public announcements every time the air quality is bad, we draw attention to uh, the fact that there is a problem. And uh, we are trying to, uh, you know, make uh, the connection between uh, the pollution and your actions. And uh, this great day project that we had worked perfectly because people were using the hashtag great day putting pictures of themselves, uh, taking buses or walking or using a bike to go to work instead of a polluting car. So uh, by using social media also, we uh, have had short videos on social media uh, that our press, uh, the city's press agency is responsible for, also on Facebook and other uh, the platforms that are uh, widely used in Iceland. I think uh, the, there is no easy solution to this, but the main thing is trying to get the message across to as big a group as possible and on as many platforms as possible, because slowly this gets into people's minds and it changes their mindset. We have, we have seen a huge uh, change in the mindset of the people in Reykjavik, and people are starting to demand better air quality. And they're beginning to see the uh, connection that uh, they are also a part of the problem, that you have to uh, do what uh, is responsible in your own case. And slowly, uh, the number of citizens that will do the right thing will increase. Uh, Britt, maybe you have some uh, additional comments? Yeah, I just have to say first that I agree very much with the, what Svava says. We have the very much the same experience. Um, it has, in Norway, quite early, we were very open with the, um, showing all the data from the air quality station. Uh, also, we um, were openly sort of saying when did we exceed the limit values uh, set by the air quality directives. And this, uh, we saw the in also the the media. Uh, we were um, trying to get the information also to the media, media, so they should understand the uh, implication of high air quality. So they also helped us sort of um, make making the public aware of the health threat uh, air pollution has, um, and gradually the citizens started to. Um, be put more and more positive to the measures. You know, at, in the measures that I've showed with uh, increased taxes and so on, of course, has not been popular when they were implemented in the start. But 
gradually people has uh, accepted it and uh, and they see that the air quality is improving they see that you know there are parts of oslo that uh, has now been um, where cars are forbidden you know, um, individual streets and and so on and people actually see that this brings something good to to the city with cleaner air and nicer neighborhoods um so i think this is a it's a process that takes some time and we also had many of these campaigns similar to what Svava said like uh, walking to the school campaign for example has been a very strong effort in norway we don't want the um, parents to drive the the uh, children to the school, but they should walk um, if it's if possible. And all these campaigns um, gradually has changed. So now when the toll taxes in Oslo increased quite a lot uh, a few years ago, there were huge protests, but it was not the citizens. It's not, it was not the people living in the city who protested. It was the people outside because the people inside, they start to realize that the environment has really improved. It's made the city a better place to live. But it is a, it's not a, like a quick fix. It has, it's a process that will take some time. But this is actually but, but what, I, I don't, what I wanted. I'm sorry. Yeah, but I just, I, I don't think, mm-hmm. yeah, sorry. No, sorry, sorry, just, just finish, I'm sorry. No, I just think that at some point, if, um, it's, it's important to work to get the public uh, on board, but at some point there has to be it's a, I think it's difficult not uh, to avoid having um, measures that will meet some protest from part of the public. Uh, I think uh, I would just like to say that uh, transport is uh, a little bit different challenge than mm. uh, pollution from, from domestic sector. This involves um, much bigger change for the people, much bigger investment. But I would say that what uh, is missing sometimes in the information given to the public is the evidence base, based not on calculations, but on real life experience. So if there is a mismatch between what people hear from the ad campaigns and what they know from their own experience, they stop believing the message. So I think it's very important to really understand the context of local problem. And then after you understand this, then create the message to the public. Uh, Wroclaw is very good at different communication channels. Facebook is great, all social media is great, but it's for the younger generation. And we all teach students. We can see in the last few years there has been a huge change in the attitudes towards air quality and environmental issues in general. The younger generation is in general more aware than a few years ago. There there is a change, visible change. But with housing and air pollution, A big part of the problem is old people. Old people stuck in their old houses with old stoves. And you will not reach them with Facebook. Wroclaw has uh, very um, informative programs on local television trying to reach those different audiences. So when thinking about successful campaigns, I think it's important to first to understand where is the problem, which part of the society should be informed most about the problem, and target the message towards this specific audience. And I think we also have to mention that it's a long process. It cannot be done ad hoc. So when we start today, we may have, uh, in few years' time, we may have a first effect. So basically, this is also um, tough in this, from this point of view. Thank you. If I may, I'll, I'll continue just a little bit. Thank you very much. Actually, it is, I'm, I'm filled with... Uh, 
positive um, inspiration, I would say, and I am a patient person, so yes, I'm going to wait. It's a very tricky thing that all of you mentioned that it takes time, it's a process, I know. I didn't mention exactly how many years, is it like two years or seven or 15, but I'm patient, so I'm going to wait. Um, and yes, I think that maybe now this is more of a question or a little um, comment to the Polish Wrocław team, because we have a bit of a common experience, indeed, the reasons for air pollution in our city are mainly the domestic solid fuel combustion. And it's also, um, I mean, we don't know exactly yet the scale of where are exactly the reasons, whether there's more people who cannot afford, maybe not just the change of the stove, but later to, to maintaining it and actually keeping paying for other, other fuels, that would be one thing. But then there's also something with the mentality because we see houses that are really nicely looking, big villas, and they're still having this smoke from their chimneys that clearly shows that it is not uh, a proper fuel. So maybe there's also some experiences from your side, like you've, uh, you've mentioned several programs to, to support even economically the citizens to change the stoves, but what problems, what troubles have you encountered and, and maybe there's some also good suggestions how to solve them. We do implement this, such a program, but I think it's a smaller scale still. Magdalena, I think maybe. Uh, I, I would very much like to invite you to the next session. <laughs> where we will talk much more in detail about uh, the problems and the, the, the sources of the problems with uh, changing of uh, solid f transition from solid fuel to other fuels for uh, heating, for space heating. But with those big villas, it's a, it's a major problem. <laughs> And uh, I think it's a tricky thing that sometimes technology helps us solve environmental problems and sometimes it doesn't. What we will be talking about in the next session is more the crash between old technology that causes air pollution. But the new villas heated with solid fuel and still uh, you can see the smoke from their chimneys. This is only made possible because of new types of stoves with automatic filling. So you don't have to spend three hours a day on cleaning and, uh, and burning the solid fuel. It is all done automatically. All you have to do is once a week or every few days, depending on the weather, go and, and add the fuel. But it's relatively much cleaner process than in the old buildings. So I think this uh, introduction of this new technology that allows automation of the heating, of, of adding fuel to the stove, is something that has created a problem that will last longer than it would if the problem was only um, concentrated in the old buildings. Because convenience, we are all we all like comfort and convenience, and uh, all solid fuel in the buildings that we will be talking about is extremely inconvenient type of heating. But in the villas, it's cheaper. The buildings are insulated, and it's convenient. So it's a, this is the point where the national policy has to stand in and help local authorities to discourage people from using but through taxes, like, you know, with transport, through taxes, for example, through... There are different measures, yes, but uh, this is a real problem, a very different problem that we will, we will be talking about in the next session. Yes, I would like to add to this huge villas. Uh, uh, you know, all the new technologies are um, expensive at the beginning. And when you have a solid fuel burner with this, autom uh, with this automation system, um, it's much cheaper with the different solutions. So it really be, has to be uh, somehow supported by the local or national law to avoid such a solutions in uh, houses built by um, people who um, are able to buy the newer and, and cleaner technologies. 
Is it the answer for your question? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Of course, you can also ask the question in Polish. It's not a problem. I think we just run out of time. So they are telling us that we are run, of, uh, run out of time. Thank you. I really would like to thank for this few months, half a year, uh, of cooperation uh, with our experts, uh, Svava and Vrit and Magdalena and Natalia. It was great experience. We learned a lot. We exchanged the knowledge. I hope we will have a possibility to meet again and hopefully also cooperate in such initiatives. Thank you very much. I was the one to bring the news about the running out of time, so I will be also the one to encourage you to find our experts in FUIA. It might be a bit harder with the experts from Norway and Iceland, but with the rest you can still talk uh, during the short break that I will invite you in just a minute. And as Magdalena Baborska narożny already mentioned, our next panel that will start at 3.20 p.m. will uh, go deeper into that subject. We will talk about uh, the heating in urban tenements. Uh, so join us here for the last session of Diversity 4 at 3.20 and now enjoy your break. Thank you again for, uh, to the team that uh, took on the subject of environment. Thank you very much. Thank you.